1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. May God richly bless the reading of his word. Well, as we prepare to look at this word, let's pray once more, asking for the Lord's particular help to guide us and teach us. Father, we do bow to you. Uh, We confess our, our weakness, our fallenness. We confess our, our even spiritual blindness, maybe blindness to our own, certainly our own sins at times. And so we ask that as we turn to this word, your spirit would just open up our eyes to see glorious things of Jesus Christ. And he's a great redeemer and savior. Because this law that you give us, it's perfect and it revives the soul. And this testimony you have given us, it is sure. It makes us wise. Your precepts, O Lord, are right. They cause rejoicing in the heart. May that happen as we turn to this word. The commandment of your Lord is pure. May it give light to our eyes. The fear of you, you, O Lord, is clean. It endures forever. Your rules are true and righteous altogether. So may we want them like nothing more on this earth. For with your words there is life. Let the words of my mouth then and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the great irony of the church denominational landscape, which admittedly Grace Bible Church is not too attuned to in one sense, but it's all over the news. The great irony over this past year uh, must be this, the splitting up of the United Methodist Church. Uh, Like many other churches, the mounting pressure to accept the LGBTQ plus alphabet soup To accept those behaviors and attitudes as normal, it's finally even cracked in on the second largest denomination in the United States. Uh, This fracturing has resulted in nearly 8,000 congregations. That's about one quarter of all of their congregations leaving the United Methodist Church. Political scientist Ryan Burge contends that this is, quote, the biggest denominational schism ever. Part of me it finds that hard to believe. I wonder how he's calculating this. But it is massive and certainly is in American history, the most divisive or largest. But i got to think, there's been other big ones. Can you try the East and West Schism of the Church, it's called, in 1054, where we found then after that Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. Before that, it was in some senses a united church. Either way, it seems sad to know, but churches are known for this for splitting, for divisions. Sadly, too often Christ's people, again, Christ who prayed that we would be one, too often we, His people, we can't seem to get along so well. We lose our way, we split up. And admittedly, sometimes though, I think the the division's necessary, it's good. Uh, Again, I would think that's the case here with the the not-so-united Methodists, that I think some are doing well to have left to try and be more faithful to the gospel when their denomination at large is compromised. But uh, too often our divisions are not around those big important things 
Now, they're so foundational to the gospel. But so often, especially as you get to the local church size, divisions are actually caused much more by like power plays, small town politics, you might say, sin, abuse, selfishness, and so many more things we could enumerate. Maybe some you know from your own church life. But I think it's clear this ought not be so. Can we say that? Especially since Christ prayed for us. And he's prayed for us as his church directly, even when he was here on earth in the Garden of Gethsemane. Listen to this. This is from the high priestly prayer, we call it, of John 17. And Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, and he's speaking there about the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So all Christians afterward that have believed the testament of the gospel that the apostles handed down to us, Jesus is praying for in the garden. And here's what he prayed. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, but so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is even crucial to our mission and to our testimony to the world. And Paul understands that quest for unity, it starts right here. It starts with the local church. That's where it has to begin. That's where it has to, really, the battle is won. It's when one here as the church unites under Jesus Christ. And that's the theme as we turn this morning. So, so far as we began Corinthians, what have we been seeing? We've been, he's been encouraging them. He's been giving them the truths that God's at work in you and he so blessed you. But remember that he was getting them ready to hear the things that Christ had to say to his church that weren't easy to hear. Here comes the rebuke. Here comes the challenge. And he begins first with divisions. So the word for us is strive for the unity of the local church. This is something we have to strive for. You have to pursue. You have to foster. You have to love it. You have to cherish it. You have to want it. You have to pursue it with all that you are for your local church. But we'll also see the kind of unity that Christ is after is not a unity just for unity's sake. It's a unity around Him and the gospel. So strive for the unity of the local church around Christ and His Word. And we'll have three charges, three recommendations that will get us there as we look at verses 10 to 17 of 1 Corinthians. And the first of the three is this. You need to first remove the acceptance of division. You need to remove from your mind the division, church splits, factions, cliques even, that that's just part of church life. You need to remove from your mind that that's acceptable. And you have to work against it. And that's where we begin, really, because that's where Paul begins. We need to remove from our mind the toleration of divisions. Divisions, factions, they're not okay. And we need to understand the great trouble and blight they bring on the gospel and on Christ's name. Such that, again, remember, he's begun, we looked at verses, namely, 4 through 9 over the past couple weeks. God has been so good to the Corinthian church. And yet, despite that, they have all kinds of problems, don't they? As we start to relay those throughout the book, I mean, they're abuse of the spiritual gifts. They got people in gross sexual immorality. They have people imposing their convictions on others and judging others for it. There's all kinds of divisions and other issues. But the chief one he goes to is right here on being their factions and their divisions. It's where he begins. And we see the importance of it because the kind of weight he puts behind this. Not only does he address it first... Again, because if you could go through Corinthians and list all of their problems, like what one would you go to first? It's like, I might go to, well, the gross sexual morality that's going on. How can can you put that aside? Or or what about this? I mean, they're fumbling with the very doctrines of the gospel of Jesus' resurrection. Like they seem to be very confused on that. Don't you have to go there first? Well, here's where Paul goes first. Factions and divisions is where he goes. This is astonishing to me. And as he addresses it first, he gives its full-throated power by noting Christ's authority when he does it. Look at verse 10. So remember, he was encouraging before, but now he's turning. He wasn't buttering them up, but he was getting them ready. Here's how you need to change. And so let's talk about this. I appeal to you, brothers. And even there, we're going to be talking about divisions. But where does he go from the beginning? It's like, we're family, Remember? And we're not family because we chose to be together. That's not how family works. Don't we know that? We're family because Christ bought us together. Okay, when he, when he buys you into salvation, he's brought many other fellow sinners with you. That's now your family. 
Family's got issues. Corinth has issues, sure. But they're brothers all the same. Now, but he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you hear the authority there. This is not an option, what he's about to say. Namely, that they need to be in agreement, that they need to be united, that all of you agree, that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and same judgment. Before he gets there, he's saying, it's by the word of Christ I'm calling you to this. This is not an option. This is not, boy, it'd be nice to be in a nice, united, unified church. No, th- th- this, is, this is basic. This is elementary. This is fundamental to who we are. Strive for unity. Pursue it. Want it. Get after it. Because Christ is the Lord of His church. That's what He calls us to. Now, what should this unity look like? He explores for us three different ways about, or in three different terms, what this unity must be. And the first is this. What does it look like to be united under the banner of Christ? Again, he gives us three ways. Let's look at this, verse 10. I'd appeal you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that one, all of you agree, see that, and then two, that there be no divisions among you, but that three, you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. So let's take each one of those. Explore what this unity is. In the first place, he says, he wants all of them to agree. Literally, it means to say the same thing, to be on the same page, to be parroting the same words back and forth. That shows agreement of some kind. You know, like when you're trying to communicate with someone, do you ever do this? It's a good strategy, by the way. Communication helps with Rick Zayman. No, let's put that aside. No, when you're talking with somebody and you want to make sure they understand you or that you've been understood or that you're understanding what they're saying, you might say, Are, they've told you something and you tell them back, are you saying this and put it in your own words? And then they get to hear and be like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Or they said, no, you totally misunderstood me, Rick, again, right? So we're able to pair back and forth, but when we're saying the same thing, like we're in an agreement, we, we have found a consensus, we are communicating, we're working back and forth. And from the first century, this expression, actually to say the same thing as, this is what kind of the politicians would use as they rally behind a, an idea or a mantra. And politicians of the first century apparently work a lot like politicians in our century. And this is what we do. We rally behind slogans, don't we? Make America great again. Build back better. These are the, the, the values that get put forward that are trying to unite, say, a party. And you look at both of the major parties in our, in our United States right now. I mean, they are factious among themselves. And yet they're able to consolidate, consolidate behind a single platform and a candidate, mostly. We'll talk about that. But the point is, they've, they've rallied behind that single agreed mantra, that great value that they will put forward, and it dwarfs the others. Because the point is, when you, agree, when you say the same thing as when you're coming into agreement, that doesn't mean you whitewash over every other disagreement. But you're saying, what agreement, what issue is the most valuable? Because again, even when the political parties of our day, when they unite, oh, they still have many other passions, but they know, but I got to put this one first. And that's what Paul is calling the church to do. That means you're going to need to put down some of your other preferences that are kind of like side hustles for you, theologically or in the Christian life. You got to put those aside to make sure you are advancing the main mission, united under what is important. You got to agree. Second, what does it look like? He says that there be no divisions among you. In the original language, this is the word that we get eventually schism from. A schism especially in Greek, it's, it's something that's been torn. It's been ripped apart. He said there can't be any kind of schisms like that in his church. That's not okay. Schisms are fracturing, upsetting, and in that way totally inappropriate for Christ's local church. The, the idea of a schism, I think in my mind like a piece of paper as you tear it, just quickly down the middle and you have with a torn piece of paper, unless you're OCD and you like folded it 20 times and you like licked the seam and then you pull it apart, then it's like perfect. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you just rip that paper. And what do you have on each side? You have all these jagged edges because it's been torn, it's been ripped apart. And Christ's saying, you can't do that with my church. Those kind of things, despite our common experience, those should be very strange to us if we are people of the Redeemer. 
But sadly, we, ha- we have this term, church split. I think because it's, we know what it is. Because it's so common. We run into it all the time. But understand that that rift, that painful separation between that united church that Christ is one, that he loves, that he died for. If you're not careful, you're going to injure and split it and tear it apart. And just because we have a term for it, church split, does not mean it, because it's so familiar or so common that it's good or acceptable or an option for faithful believers. It's not. Third, a united church is going to be characterized by this phrase, the end of verse 10, but that you will be united in the same mind and the same judgment. The same mind and the same judgment. You're going to be, and even the picture here is that you're restored unto this. That is, maybe there was a tear, but it's being mended and brought together so you have a singular focus and mind and drive. This shows great agreement, doesn't it? And you have here the way it's phrased. This is a kind of unity that's real, that's sincere. It's not just a unity for unity's sake. This isn't then, because when it says to have a be united in the same mind, the same judgment. This is a unity that's even a passioned unity, like a thoughtful unity, a united drive in our hearts. In other words, the word isn't to the church, well, everybody take your passion and love for Jesus and truth and just turn it down a bunch of notches. We're not talking about, let's go for Christianity milk toast, which is gross. The call is not, well, don't be so passionate. Don't be so spiritually serious. Don't be so doctrinally precise. You know, because you don't want to rock the boat. No, that's not real unity when you do that. That's a false unity. It's a unity in appearance only. You know, it's like this, or in contrast to this. If I told you, you know, this past summer, my boys and I, we had a great game of -of tug-of-war. You know, I was at this summer camp. And we were, we were all holding the rope together. Okay? Oh, that sounds united. We were all located at the same summer camp together. We were on the same field. Oh, that sounds very united. But then what if I told you, well, we were on opposite ends of the rope pulling each other the other way. That's not unity. At least as Paul visions it here. This is a unity where we're pulling the same direction. That's the way it should be. That's what we need to strive and try and keep. So you have to remove from your mind the very acceptance of the notion, ah, a bit of division's okay. That's not how Christ's church works. And you know, I trust you do, that if you're going to have that kind of unity, even as we see described here, the only way it comes is by a big dose of humility. That's how you hold that together. In particular, I'll tie that for you uh, from Philippians chapter 2. Uh, There in Philippians chapter 2, Paul's exhorting the church there, and and he's calling them to unity. He says, this is the one thing I want for you. This is uh, Philippians 2, verse 2. Complete my joy. (laughs) Imagine a pastor saying that to a, a fracturing church. Complete my joy. What would delight him more than this and our Savior? But being of the same mind. Very similar language. Having the same love and being in full accord. And in one mind, very similar language. That's what the unity is going to look like. But how do we get there? He tells us exactly how to get there. How are you going to have that kind of unity and keep it and preserve it? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Do nothing. Rather, in humility, this is revolutionary, count others more significant than yourself. You do that, guess what? This church stays united. And you're not focused on you, or he explains it. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You do that, the local church stays together. So before you go about, right, championing your little theological tribe, before you go about sowing seeds of discord and faction among the members, before you start just publicly being critical of the leaders, before you go on about pressing unto others your convictions about this is the way to live the Christian life if you're a serious Christian. 
And some of those things might be very important, but you just got to first stop and think about what you're doing. Is this going to help Christ church? Is this going to foster unity? Is this going to result in a rallying to the scriptures and a oneness of mind and judgment? Or are you starting those tears that are going to be rifts of division? Because get this, if you feel so passionate about these things that you have to lead others into these things, into these, you know, whatever it is, the very specific way you lead your family as a Christian, realize you might be very passionate about it, but you might unwittingly be doing all kinds of harm to his church. And I think sometimes we do those things because we're trying to justify to ourselves that, yeah, this is really important or that we really do got it. You might be more concerned about being, I'm precisely right, than you are actually about helping souls walk with Jesus. Which, by the way, you know what that is? It's a process. Well, you're saying we need to less. let false doctrines in here and bad practices go unchecked. No, of course not. Not at all. And neither is Paul saying that. We'll speak, we'll speak a bit more to about what real unity is around. But suffice it to say here, you could win the truth battle or you could win the holiness battle. You you could win the the theological argument the day uh, or or the reason your particular Christian practice like homeschooling or family integrated church about how that's the faithful way. You might win the battle and in that way win the argument but lose the gospel war and rip the church apart. And then you've lost. We all have. And Paul's point, that's not acceptable collateral damage for the sake of truth. Unity is a gift won at the cross, and we need to prize it, foster it, protect it, and that for the sake of his name, right? Remember that prayer. Second, we must reject the cults of personality, verses 11 and 12. Reject the cults of personality. All too often, the common source of division is this great affinity for pastors, Bible teachers, whatever you want to call them, these personalities instead of Christ. To stay united, we got to put those all aside. And for Paul, it wasn't just a hunch that this was an issue in Corinth. He got a direct report about it. Let's look at verse 11. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Well, first of all, we're like, well, who's Chloe? (laughs) And who are her people? And why are they talking about her church like this? And honestly, we don't have, you know, a lot of cross-references or details to pull this out. So we got to maybe read between the lines a little bit. But I think we can get an accurate accurate enough picture that we can move from. In the first place, you know, let's put it this way. You know that Chloe... Or we can know this about Chloe. The Corinthians knew exactly who she was and who her people were. Because she needs no further introduction. So when they're talking about, when Paul's talking about Chloe's people, everybody in Corinth is like, oh yeah, I remember them. And who were they? Best we can surmise, Chloe, especially because she's not mentioned with her husband. She is probably either a widow or one way or another, a, a woman who's now single, but who has a how would you put it? She's very successful in business. She's a great merchant woman. We see this like in Philippi as well with others. She's a successful merchant woman, and she's doing business in Corinth, which was the economic center of that time. She probably lives in Ephesus, where Paul is now writing this letter to the church at Corinth. You follow? Paul and Chloe are now living in Ephesus, and Her people had gone to Corinth to do business, but they met up with their fellow Christians there and such that though when they came back, here was the first thing evidently on their mouth and on their mind about the church in Corinth. Oh, they are factious. And this this report to Paul has him very concerned. Because notice even the words used here to describe what was found among them. Again, back to verse 11. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. There's quarrels here. These aren't just silos within the church, right? That you got like this group and this group and this group and this group under the big church rubric, and that's wrong. That's not what he's getting at. You got these groups 
They're, they're not little silos that aren't connected. They are separate, entrenched battlefields doing war with other groups in the church effectively. That's what he calls it when he calls it a quarrel. One commentator described it. This is a hot dispute, the emotional flame that ignites whenever rivalry becomes intolerable. This is emotionally charged. These are not people without passions. Later on in 2 Corinthians, Paul spells it out a bit more with what these quarrels can look like. Listen to this. This is a great cross-reference to explore. What is quarreling? 2 Corinthians 12.20. So Paul's concerned. He's going to show up there on site in Corinth. And he says, and then perhaps there may be quarreling. What does that look like? Jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I mean, that's prime daytime television is what that is. That's the Jerry Springer show. People can't turn away but watch this stuff, right? Well, these things are not at all to be a part of his church. Jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. Quarreling, in another word. Well, what was causing this? What, what, was, what was proving the banners that these different groups were running under to advocate for and that was creating these rifts in the church? Well, we find out in verse 12 here of chapter 1, he explains it just so clearly. What I mean is, don't you love that? You're like, thank you, Paul. What are you getting at? What I mean is, is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ even. What's happening here in Corinth? The cult of personality. That's what's happening. The church has not only divided to their favorite preachers, but now they're fighting over them. Why do we do this? I think partly we can't exalt one preacher over another without cutting down the others in the process. And can you guess what happens when you try cutting down someone else's favorite pastor? (laughs) It makes for division. It makes for contention. They become divided as they champion their own favorite. Some devotedly followed Paul. He was the church planner here. Others followed the more powerful and probably articulate, certainly uh, more skilled as a, as a rhetoric person, Apollos. Or others were convinced by Peter, that is Cephas here, when he had probably come to visit. They divided around all of their favorites. I mean, we've seen that in some churches, right? You've got like all of the Sunday school classes are devoted to like one particular teacher. And then all of those Sunday school classes might come into one place for worship, but really the church is wholly divided among all of their favorites. And of course, the trouble isn't, okay, to be thankful for gifted ministers that have helped you. That's good, and you should be thankful, and you should give them double honor even. The trouble is when that results in an unhealthy allegiance and a following of that other teacher. That's the cult of personality. What's that? when the person becomes more important than the message or ministry itself. That's when you hear a criticism maybe about that pastor and you say, there's no way that can be true. I know he's never like that. Now note, in this case, sometimes the fault of the cult of personality, it's not even the fault of the quote personality himself or the teacher or preacher. I don't think that was the case here. Do you see that? I don't think Paul was trying to rally for influence and having his people represent him in Corinth, or certainly Apollos or Cephas the same. But here's the trouble. Who, who, who was forming these cults of personality then? The people. Why? Because we act like sheep. Which means we can be very thankful, but then we can be very dumb. We can be thankful for how God's gifted different people, but then we always are feeling, I need to advocate and defend my teacher, even maybe in his faults. And I'll usually advance my teacher at the expense of exposing the deficiencies of others. You know, we hear things like this for the, you know, you got the MacArthurites and you got the Piperites and you got the the Wilsonites or the whatever, and they're all wrangling with each other. Oh, John MacArthur, I mean, he's the best, most clearest expositor there ever was. 
John Piper is just way too flashy, distracting from the gospel. You got the John Piperites. Oh, but he's so impassioned. He so desires God. I wish MacArthur would do something like that at least once, right? And then we start getting at each other. Would you be surprised that creates division and conflict? Now, sometimes the fanboys are not always to blame. Sometimes it's the minister himself, isn't it? When they're out more to make a name for themselves than they are for the name of Christ. You know, I think anytime you like come into a church or you're on a website and you have the ministries of so-and-so and it's their name, like that's a yellow flag at best, if not a red one, and be warned. I mean, who are you trying to make a name for? Whose brand are you trying to advance? Your own? So you can sell more books or what? Are you trying to advance the name of Christ? Because get this, the church isn't big enough for two leaders. The church is not a two-headed monster. It has one, and his name is Jesus Christ. Well, what are the warning signs that things have gotten out of balance here? It's okay to even have a favorite pastor. I so am thankful for John Piper and his passion and his ministry in my life. I was at John MacArthur's church for years. So thankful for that man's investment of the Word and in other men that invested in me. I praise God for that. But it's easy to take that gratitude and it turns into almost worship. And to guard me from that early on, I had a theology professor in my undergrad. And he would warn us. You know, he's a theology professor, C.W. Smith dear man who's now with Christ. And, you know, we we were budding, nerdy, impassioned, immature theology students. So we would bring all kinds of questions to him. And whenever we bring a question like, CW, what do you think about whatever? And he would stop us, especially when we'd start like this. CW, I heard John MacArthur say, CW, but John Piper says, and he would say, Stop right there. Stop right there. So what? Who cares what they say? What does this say? What has Christ said? That's the one we follow. And I've seen it. We like to latch on to some dynamic teacher and pastor. I think sometimes because we don't want to think for ourselves anymore. Or maybe he justifies some action or behavior that we think we want to continue in. And maybe it's even sinful. And he carved out a place for that. So I'll justify him in whatever he says because it allows me to stick with what I'm doing. But the issue is, we can be thankful, but what if they're wrong? Because they're men, they can be wrong. I mean, I got two guys that hang in my office that I esteem. John Calvin and John Owen, but they were dead wrong on baptism, okay? And now they're in heaven convinced Baptist, praise God. (laughs) But are we going to stay devoted to some person in their teaching or the teaching that bears their name, or are we going to stay devoted to Christ in whatever His Word says? Are you going to stay devoted to some system because you think it makes sense, whether it's Reformed Calvinistic theology or whether it's Darby Ryrie dispensationalism, are you going to stick to it because of what it teaches as a system or because of what the Scriptures lay out for us? Are you going to hold to it because the system makes sense or because the Bible teaches it? you got to see this. Followers of Christ, when we put away those isms and ists and being ites of someone else, when we put those all away, we can all, as Christians, rally under the Scripture. Now, we might still disagree, but I hope we disagree by, but didn't you see what this Scripture says? Let's walk through this. Oh, but John, I I don't care. I mean, I do care. He's a gifted teacher, but we got to evaluate it by what this says, right? And we might still not come to the meeting of the minds about everything. That's why we have different denominations, Baptists and non-Baptists, right? But they love the gospel and love Christ, and they have agreement on that for together. But as soon as we start to favor a teacher or some doctrinal system, we start letting that be our authority instead of the Scripture in Christ. We become more devoted for them, and what happens then? Factions, separations, divisions, and quarrels are inevitable. We can't do it. Third, but we got to rally somewhere. We touched on this. 
We see it so expressly here. We rally to the message of the cross. Verses 13 to 17. And to make this point, he begins in verse 13, you know, after he's postulated these different groups. You know, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, so forth. Well, then he gives them these three questions just to show us how dumb it is to talk like that. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? And then even more, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And of course, the answer, the big answer to all these is no. And so our devotion to any pastor or teacher has just got to be checked. It's got to be held by the just honest limitations of who that man is. And I love this because Paul starts with himself. Couldn't he start with like, well, you understand Apollos, he had to be taken aside and mentored by by these these others in the church to get a more accurate understanding. He didn't have it like I did from the very beginning. That's where he could have gone. He doesn't go there. He starts right with him to point out the ridiculousness of it. Was Paul crucified for you? He's undermining his own little faction. No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? If you're more concerned or more adamant with identifying yourself as a Calvinist than you are as a Christian, then what are you trying to say? Who saved you? The five points of Calvinism or Jesus Christ on the cross? Are you more concerned with holding to the right end times doctrine than to the true Christ and his people and the gospel? Well, what do you talk about the most? You might say it's the right answer, but is that what's coming out of your heart? It is, we might check the right theological box. Oh, yeah, I know the gospel is most important. But what is the emphasis that comes out of your life? You might, unbeknownst, be sowing seeds of discord. Another way to say it or ask it is just what defines you? What name would people most associate with you? Oh, he's the end times guy around here. We're thankful for end times people. It's a big part of the Bible, actually, and very important. Oh, oh he, he, he's like the 12, 18-point Calvinist. He's really into it. Or is it the name, oh, he loves Christ, and he loves his church? Amen. You weren't baptized in the name of Calvin, were you? Hope not. Neither would Calvin. You baptized in the name of MacArthur, Piper, Wilson? What was it? Or, or maybe for some of us, you know, those are like our little theological camps. Some of you are like, ah, I'm not in any theological camp. Amen, Christian. But maybe you were baptized in the name of homeschooling. It's like your way to live the Christian life. Or you were baptized into republicanism or conservatism or Trumpism, whatever it is. Or were you baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Because whatever the name is, whatever is defying you, defining you, if it's not Christ, it's trying to supplant his place as ruler of your life and of his church. And that's why with Paul, he just wants to get out of the way. That's what ministry is about for him. Look at this. Look at verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you. Let's just stop there for a second. This is awesome. I'm baptized that I, or excuse me, I'm thankful I baptized none of you. Imagine like sending the report back to the denominational head. I'm thankful to have baptized nobody, period. Take that denomination. And then he adds a few people, Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say you were baptized in my name. Notice the purpose. He's trying to get out of the way. So that no one would say they were baptized in my name. And then he adds, I love this. It's like, it's like oh yeah, I forgot. I baptized Stephanus too. Verse 16. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anybody else. <laughs> and this had to be quite intentional. I don't think... You know, as he says this at the end, I don't know whether I baptized anybody else. I don't think it's because he baptized so many and he just couldn't keep track of all their names. I mean, think about this. He was in Corinth 18 months. And Corinth was a thriving church with a lot of spiritual gifts and a lot of people here. So how could it be that their founding apostle only baptized such a few people? How is it? That was on purpose. It was on purpose to get the attention off of him and keep it on Christ. It wasn't his power, his intellect, his great insight 
that made the gospel effective. It was the power of the preached word that the Spirit uses. Paul wanted his ministry. He was imbibing that mentality of John the Baptist, right? He, Christ, must increase. That means I got to decrease. And he embraced it because he was making a name for Christ, not for himself. Verse 17, then. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And again, you see verse 17 begins with four. So this is an explanation. And in the, in the end, it's explaining that somewhat curious statement from verse 14. Again, to look at it. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And again, we kind of stumble over that. I mean, are we glad for baptisms? Aren't they such a precious thing here to hear the testimony of people professing how Christ has saved them by the cross and redeemed them and changed them? But here's the thing. That wasn't Paul's mission. That wasn't his responsibility. He couldn't even work that. He understands that. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, in the coming weeks. Verse 17, what was his responsibility? Christ did not send me to baptize, but what did he send me to do? To preach the gospel, the good news. That's why he can make a distinction between baptism and gospel preaching. Even diminish baptism and emphasize gospel preaching. Why? Because baptism doesn't save anybody. Gospel preaching, married with faith, that's what saves. Baptism doesn't save, but it's a trust, faith in Christ who died for your sins and rose from the dead to forgive all your sins. That good news is what saves, such that you can baptize people all day long, get them all dunked even and immersed, the right way to do it, by the way. But unless they've trusted in Christ, it means zip. It does nothing but get people wet. The same goes for any supposed other sacrament. The power's not in man. It's not in Paul. You know, it's not, oh, I was a member of John MacArthur's church. I have some special anointing. That's not how this works. It's not, oh, I heard John Piper preach, so I have the Spirit and I can bless others. That's not how this works. Same way, taking the Lord's table, that doesn't save anybody. It doesn't work forgiveness. And any work you would do, sharing the gospel, that doesn't save you. Reading your Bible, attending church, giving to church, nope, no, and no. None of those things will rescue sinners. And that's not our mission. Our mission is not to make people good givers. Our mission is not to make people good church attenders or good short-term mission trip goers. Our mission is what? Like Paul, preach the good news. That's how people come to Christ. But notice here, to do so in a way that doesn't detract from the saving message. Again, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But then even in a way. How? And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. I mean, shouldn't we want to get the gospel out as most eloquently as we can? Shouldn't we want to adorn those words most thoughtfully to make it the most compelling message we possibly can? Don't we want to preach with the most passion that we can possibly put onto it? Is there a sense where we're like, yes, because there is no more important message, but another sense where we're like, maybe not. And why not? Because maybe we're drawing the attention more to ourselves than we are to Christ. And any true minister worth his salt wants you to remember Christ, not him. And so as one example, one of my favorite pastors, who I won't even name here. You can ask me later. Actually, somebody did between services. But he's kind of taken this truth into his own life and his own ministry. And I think a helpful way that's indicative for all of us as we live our Christian life. What he does uh, as it regards his pulpit ministry on Sunday mornings, he preaches week in, week out. Uh, he writes out his sermons painstakingly, word for word, but more than that, he takes that manuscript with him into the pulpit and effectively reads it. Now, he's a very gifted communicator. You can't just tell he's reading something. Uh, you could tell if I was all the time, but no comment there. 
And he was very gifted. I mean, but this guy, he's known for advocating for boring orthodoxy over exciting heresy all day and all night. Tells you where he's coming from. But here's the thing. Why does he use and read from a manuscript? Because by the way, if you don't speak often in front of people, you can be much more engaging when you put that manuscript away and you're looking people more in the eye and talking with them. Well, why wouldn't he want to do that all the more? Don't you want to be as engaging as possible, especially when you preach about Christ? Well, yes, but I'll say perhaps, and this pastor realized it early on, if I can rein in my charisma a bit, if I can rein in, and he has one, a very dynamic personality a bit, and maybe I can do that by way of the manuscript, if I can do that, I'm going to help my listeners think more about Jesus by the end of this sermon than me. And that's a win for the sake of the gospel. And that really should be our mentality in everything we do as Christians. Why? Because Christ is the one who saves, not us being good. Furthermore, any church built on a man is not going to be around very long once that gifted man is gone. But Christ builds his church on the gospel word, and that's what unites us. So, it's true in the old pulpits, they used to have little plaques that said this, When the preacher would come up, the thing he would see, it says, Sir, show us Jesus. But really, that should be the mantra of our life. We're not trying to show off, here's how good of a neighbor I am. We're trying to show off Jesus Christ. We're not trying to show to our kids even, you have a really good mommy and daddy. We're trying to show our kids, you've got a great Jesus if you trust him. We don't want to be known as just a good friend, a good employee, a good leader, a good business person without them seeing most of all Jesus Christ in us. Why? Because the power to save is in Him. It's not in us to persuade, to manipulate, cajole. And if we do that, what's the problem? Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This was the big issue, I think, with the what was known as the seeker-sensitive church movement. I think this is part of the trouble. Instead of being faithful messengers and stewards of the message of the gospel, first and foremost, they, and I, I want to believe the best, that they were out trying to reach people for Christ, but they ended up, you could say, doing it with words of eloquent wisdom. They took the strategies for gathering crowds that the world would know, and use them for the church. So what did that mean? They were going to start a new church, so they went through the neighborhood, and they went knocking on doors. That's pretty common for churches, actually. Except when they came and the people answered, they weren't giving out the gospel to them. What were they giving them? A survey to say, what are your felt needs? What does this community need? And would you be surprised that unbelievers who don't know Christ, they're not aware their greatest need is their sin and their enmity with God. So they don't know they need the gospel. But they know they need belonging. They know they love quality music and good concerts. And so what happened? That's what these churches gave them. And what happened? It drew crowds. And the people stuck around. And again, I think the intentions were in the best light. Oh, we'll bring in these crowds, but then you know what we'll do? We'll get to share the gospel with them. And to that, I'm like, that's great. But what did we actually find happened? Once we started sharing the truth of the gospel, what happened? The people left. Why? Because they didn't want to hear it in the first place. You stopped scratching their itches. They didn't want to stick around. And so then what do you make of all the church numbers and baptisms and programs and attendance records? Well, the cross was emptied of its forgiving, transforming power because the gospel message was emptied of the cross. The gospel in Christ's church is not about marketing. It's not about niche ministry models. It's not about branding. It's not about a look. It's not about a sound. It's not a demographic, a feel, or a vibe. The church of Jesus Christ is about this, that he came to die for sinners and rose from the dead. And the message that heralds and that proclaims that, you're going to have to give out some bad news. And admittedly, they're not going to want to hear it, and we're going to be tempted to sugarcoat it, dodge it. Well, that's not really sin, I think. But here's the thing. The gospel tells you that you're worse than your thought and you're really worse than you ever dreamed. But it also tells you there's a Savior who's more gracious, more merciful, more powerful than you could imagine. 
That's the glorious news we offer. It's not in a preacher, it's not in a building, it's not in a sacrament, it's not in a pilgrimage. We give the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what saves and this is what his church will rally to. No other emphasis, no other hobby horse, no other niche ministry can take his place. May we be a people under the feet of Jesus Christ. Let's pray for that in our hearts. Let's pray together. Indeed, Lord Jesus, we want to honor you as our Lord and Savior and Redeemer. We thank you and praise you that you are merciful to sinners. Forgive us for being so easily distracted. Forgive us in our hearts of distracting others, pointing them to ourselves, trying to exalt ourselves. Uh, You are merciful. You are gracious. You've bought this people with your blood. May we walk in faithfulness. Do that for Christ's name, we pray. Amen.